All right, first Q&A of 2024. If you want to ask me a question in the future, then make sure you follow me on Instagram at Seamlund. The first question is, are there any supplements that actually shorten your lifespan? That is a very, you know, interesting and thought provoking question. And when we are talking about supplements, then of course, most supplements don't have, you know, they're not really that well studied over the long term. There are, of course, many supplements that have a long track record of safety and effectiveness. You know, some of them are like magnesium, fish oil, glycine, those things there. They've been used for decades with without any observation in increased mortality and those kind of things actually the opposite you know with fish oil and not necessarily fish oil but any omega-3 supplements as well as magnesium then uh, those actually appear to reduce the risk of heart disease and neurodegeneration and those kind of things now i'll name a few supplements that have some association with increased mortality and uh, those primarily are like these antioxidant uh, supplements and there are a few studies indicating that antioxidant supplementation like vitamin A and vitamin E specifically are associated with increased risk of uh, mortality, which is obviously interesting because a lot of the you know, mechanistic theories about aging have to do with increased oxidative stress and inflammation. It's the free radical theory of aging or the mitochondrial free radical theory of aging that aging is caused by this accumulation of uh, reactive oxygen species and free radicals that cause inflammation and oxidative stress in the body. And the theory goes that if you suppress that, then you also increase longevity. But uh, what they actually find in animal studies is that if you completely like suppress oxidative stress, or if you like, you know, use antioxidant supplements in these animals, then uh, they don't live longer. And in some cases, they actually live shorter. So there is some benefits to having mild amount of oxidative stress. So it's called the phenomenon of mitochromesis. So small amount of reaction, reactive oxygen species, they act as a signaling molecule that turn on the body's antioxidant defense systems endogenously and have some other systemic benefits. So like a perfect example of this is exercise. Exercise increases oxidative stress and increases reactive oxygen species. But those reactive oxygen species mediate a lot of the benefits that you see from exercise. And what you also see is that blunting that inflammation and blunting that oxidative stress after exercise actually also suppresses the beneficial adaptations you see from exercise. So you don't want to minimize or you don't want to suppress all of the inflammation and oxidative stress, especially after exercise. And especially with antioxidant supplementation like vitamin C or vitamin A and uh, even like N-acetylcysteine after exercise, first of all, it has been shown to blunt some of the muscle hypertrophy response, muscle growth response, but it also can uh, mitigate some of the other beneficial adaptations from exercise. So the theory of complete nullification of, of oxidative stress is beneficial is not really shown to be true. More accurately, it's the theory of the mitohormesis, that small amounts of stress, small amount of oxidative stress is actually beneficial for longevity by increasing your body's own antioxidant defense systems and pretty much making the body more resilient. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, my favorite company for blue blocking glasses, red light therapy devices, and red light light bulbs. These items are essential for keeping your circadian rhythms aligned in a world that tries to mess them up. Instead of looking at your phone before bed and letting the blue light disrupt your melatonin production, why not wear blue blockers instead that prevent that from happening? Instead of having your bedroom lit up with bright lights, choose the more sleep-friendly alternative by opting for flicker-free red light light bulbs that don't disrupt your sleep. Bond Charge also has amazing infrared sauna blankets that can give you the same health benefits of the sauna. You also get the unique benefits of infrared light that improve joint and skin health. Head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code seam, S-I-I-M, for a 15% discount. The problem here is that people who have some sort of a, you know, adverse health condition, some sort of a comorbidity, they're taking health supplements, they're taking antioxidants, so uh, they're already at a higher risk of you know, mortality because of their comorbidities. And the use of antioxidants is just an association in that scenario. Is there any danger of ha taking antioxidants in otherwise healthy people? Would that increase the risk of mortality? Uh, I don't, like the evidence for that is quite limited, but I wouldn't just even for a healthy person you wouldn't need to take antioxidant supplements in large doses, especially because it's going to actually, you know, make your body more vulnerable to 
oxidative stress and it makes the body less resilient and it can even potentially blunt some of the po po positive adaptations from exercise. So you don't want to take large amounts of antioxidants like willy-nilly. <laughs> you don't, don't want to take large amounts of uh, antioxidants if you don't have a reason for it. Now there are situations and times where it is beneficial like if you have an infection, you got a cold, you have some other let's say high inflammatory states then um, yes, in those cases, uh, antioxidants can be good to lower that excess oxidative stress. But you definitely don't want to do it after exercise, and you definitely don't want to you know, take them regularly all the time if you, if you don't have any sickness. Now, vitamin C is probably an exception, because even if you take like super large amounts of vitamin C, you tend to just excrete it, you waste it, you don't really, you know, it doesn't have any like adverse effects uh, directly, whereas with vitamin A and vitamin E or beta carotene supplementation as well is on the list, uh, that's not uh, apparently uh, based on the studies it um, causes more harm uh, than good with NAC is uh, like NAC doesn't reduce or it doesn't increase the risk of mortality in otherwise normal people but it does just blunt the positive effects of exercise and NAC as an antioxidant that raises growth harm in human studies in the elderly people actually reduces the hallmarks of aging and reduces the other functional declines associated with aging. Now, it might work only in the elderly people, but uh, NAC is more of a safer uh, antioxidant, if that makes sense. So at least we don't have any data that NAC would be associated with increased mortality. And in fact, it's probably the opposite. But you still don't want to take like large amounts of NAC. First of all, if you're young and if you don't have any inflammation, it's just that when you're older than 45 years of age, then your glutathione levels naturally decline and your inflammation and oxidative stress increases as a result of that. And NAC plus glycine, the glycine, glycine and NAC combo glynac, that raises glutathione back up and then uh, minimizes or lowers the oxidative stress and inflammation. And lastly, the phenomenon of polypharmacy, which describes taking multiple medications itself is associated with increased mortality. But this association is also because of people who take a lot of pills and pharmaceuticals different, you know, blood pressure medication, blood sugar medication, all these other medications, they're already at a high, let's say, state of comorbidities. So they're already at a high risk of mortality because they have many comorbidities. And that's what increases their uh, mortality risk, more so than just the fact of taking more pills, if that makes sense. But if you don't need to take that many pills, then you shouldn't really take them either, in my opinion. All right, next question. How long does NMN take to work in the body? So NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide, is a common NAD booster. I've recently done a lot of research about both NR and NMN. They both work in raising NAD. They're both generally safe, although the FDA currently is trying to, like, not ban, but uh, <laughs> take NMN off the market to uh, potentially turn it into a prescription drug. We'll see how that turns out, but NMN does effectively raise NAD levels and it does so pretty rapidly like within hours and uh, it stays elevated as well, as well in a, like a dose dependent manner so like a thousand milligrams is uh, going to raise NAD more than just 250 milligrams of uh, NMN. Now when it comes to some other NAD boosters then NR is also going to raise your NAD levels in a dose dependent manner so the higher the NR dose then the higher the NAD elevation is also going to be with uh, NAM nicotinamide, so this uh, form of uh, niacin that goes into the salvage pathway of NAD biosynthesis, this one is actually the cheapest and still a very potent NAD booster. Whereas the NMN and nicotinamide riboside already feed or increase NAD after the fact of the salvage pathway, then NMN supports the salvage pathway, which I think is a little bit more of an effective strategy because it means that you're able to recycle the NAD for a lot longer. So if you just raise your NAD levels with NMN or nicotinamide riboside, but your salvage pathway doesn't work properly because of various reasons, then uh, you're just kind of creating a lot of buildup <laughs> or you're just wasting a lot of the potential because all the NAD that you create from whatever source, it still goes into the recycling of the salvage pathway. So you want to support the salvage pathway. And for that, you need to activate this enzyme NAPT which gets activated by exercise, calorie restriction, fasting, dietary phytonutrients, uh, flavonoids, polyphenols, those things, as well as circadian rhythm alignment. So being aligned with the circadian rhythms, natural sunlight and daylight in the morning, block out blue light in the evening, sleep in darkness, and those and have a regular sleep wakefulness routine, those things 
keep the NAD salvage pathway working properly. And NAM, nicotinamide, supports the NAD salvage pathway. And there are studies that using NAM, even at a dose of 200 milligrams, raises NAD levels by up to 30 fold in 30 minutes. So it's actually a very rapid increase in NAD and it stays elevated for the next eight hours or it doesn't stay obviously as elevated as it is in the beginning, but it slowly declines over the course of six hours back to baseline levels. So using NAM is very effective as well in raising NAD levels and it's much cheaper and in some ways it's more effective as well because you're kind of supporting the NAD salvage pathway uh, with NAM. The doses of 100 milligrams in NAM haven't been shown to raise NAD, so 200 milligrams apparently is the, the limit of uh, requirement for raising NAD. And 500 milligrams does so as well, but if you start taking like more than 1000 milligrams of N nicotinamide, then you might eventually cause some like liver issues and uh, those kind of things. So like 200 milligrams, 500 milligrams, somewhere between there is an effective dose for nicotinamide as well. Next question, what to eat to get over 100 grams of protein per meal so you don't have to eat for hours? So this goes back to my previous video where I talked about this new study where they found that taking a larger dose of protein, 100 grams of protein after resistance training resulted in significantly greater anabolic response and longer that lasted for like over 12 hours of anabolic response compared to taking only 25 grams of protein in that meal. Or in that case, they took like a shake. So, you know, 100 grams of protein is a lot, uh, but um, it's certainly, at least based on the evidence right now, that if you take 100 grams of protein after you've exercised, you know, one hour, two hours after the training, then that is apparently more superior for staying in an anabolic state and you stay there for like over 12 hours if that makes sense so how do you achieve that how do you take the 100 grams of protein in you know i've been practicing this for the last six to eight years this is exactly my routine that i've done i've taken 30 grams of protein before training i exercise with weights or with cardio it doesn't matter and then i take the rest of my daily protein which on average is around 100 grams maybe more so in total i get 130 to 150 grams of protein per day so how do i achieve such a high amount of protein well i just eat high protein foods in my post-workout meal you could take a shake but you know you can also achieve it with food i've never taken like a shake post-workout i've always taken it before what my foods generally you know it's if you eat something like 300 grams of a high protein source meat fish uh cottage cheese you're already getting at least 60 grams of protein from there plus some carbohydrates and vegetables as well you're going to get at least 20 to 30 grams of protein from those as well. So yes, it is like a large amount of food. I've gotten used to it. Like I never got like a stomach discomfort. I've never got bloated. I've never got any gut issues. My digestion is perfect. I can eat any food, any any phytonutrient, any antioxidant or, you know, this <laughs> polyphenol, whatever. I can eat all of those things. I have no allergies, no issues. And I still eat large amounts of food after my workout. Maybe it's my gut that is in this condition maybe it's my just genetics or whatever, but I personally at least don't have any problem eating over 100 grams of protein in one sitting, <laughs> if that makes sense. But you can easily achieve that by, you know, maybe implementing a shake if you struggle with whole foods, like you, you eat only 200 grams of meat with some carbs and uh, vegetables, and then you just have a shake next to it that gives you another additional 30 grams. So you can easily achieve that. And you don't need to have 100 grams immediately in one sitting you can also have like a small break in between there so you first eat like a main course 200 grams of meat fish or something and uh, vegetables and carbs and then the dessert with some like i do like a lot of protein yogurt so i just mix uh unflavored yogurt so the regular unflavored yogurt i mix a protein powder in there so it becomes flavored it becomes even higher protein and it's still low in calories and low in carbs, this unflavored yogurt mixed with some whey protein or casein protein, something like that. So it's very easy to get additional protein with some protein supplementation, or you know, also eat the uh, crump protein that I have, that is super high protein. It's actually twice as high in protein as beef per 100 grams. So using this uh, crump granule, as well as we have another form uh, called kana, that has, you know, it has, 40 to 56 grams of protein per 100 grams. So it's double the amount of protein in regular meat. So yeah, you can easily find ways, but 
you know, the study did find that the 100 grams is superior to 25 grams, but if you struggle with it, then you can still have multiple meals after the uh, after the workout. So you, there's no no one saying that you need to do this. Like there's you know thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who uh, don't do this 100 gram loading after workouts. I've been doing that for the last six to seven, eight years. It works great for me. But if it doesn't work for you, then you know don't force yourself. There's multiple ways to build muscle and multiple ways to get your protein in uh, for the day. Next question, how much glycine do you need on a vegan diet? On a vegan diet, your demand for glycine is slightly lower because a vegan diet is generally a lot lower in methionine as well. And methionine increases the demand for glycine. So the more methionine you eat, the more glycine you also need to balance it and prevent the rise in homocysteine that uh, can increase the risk of heart disease. And excess methionine is also associated with accelerated aging but the ratio of methionine to glycine is what like uh, determines that or is the most important part of that so if you are eating more muscle meat then your demand for glycine probably increases by at least three to five grams per day now for the basic functions per day you need you know you need 15 grams of glycine per day to cover collagen synthesis that requires 12 grams of glycine and three grams of glycine for glutathione synthesis, heme synthesis, bile bile salt synthesis, and creatine synthesis. So in total, 15 grams, but your body endogenously makes three grams. So if you subtract that, then you still need 12 grams of glycine from dietary sources or supplemental sources. If you're eating a vegan diet, then yes, the methionine is lower, so you don't need additional glycine beyond those 15 grams, but because you're also not getting that much glycine from the food, you still are at a quite, you know, you would still need uh, plenty of glycine because the, you know, a lot of the plant-based foods still don't have uh, that much uh, glycine. Like the highest glycine foods are pork skin, chicken skin, fish skin, bones, ligaments, uh, those kind of things, gelatin powder. So if you are eating plant-based diet, then yes, you need less glycine, but you still need to get glycine from dietary sources. Although, you know, the vegan foods or plant-based foods have a lot less glycine than uh, the collagenous uh, protein sources. So in that scenario, you still would like, you know, benefit from supplementing some uh, glycine. You know, depends on the person. I personally would want to get at least five grams of supplemental glycine into my diet on any diet at least. And uh, if you're eating like a higher muscle meat diet, then maybe like 10 grams of glycine as a supplement. And you can mix it up quite nicely or divide it into multiple meals per, per day and you know if you take three grams of glycine before bed and that's a like a sleep supplement that's very good for the sleep if you take three grams of glycine with your meals then you're already getting uh, a sufficient amount of glycine but yeah like on a vegan diet your glycine demand is lower than on a meat eating diet but because you're not getting that much glycine from the plant-based foods then you're you're pretty much in a scenario where you still would like I would, you would still want to consider supplementing as much as you were on a regular uh, diet. Next question is whether protein bad for the kidneys. I suggest or I think it's whey protein that you're trying to say. Um, but uh, whey protein, any protein powder or any high protein diet in otherwise healthy people hasn't been shown to cause kidney issues, hasn't been shown to promote kidney failure or uh, anything uh, like that in otherwise healthy people. If you are someone who has kidney disease or poorly functioning kidneys, then in that scenario, the higher protein intake and protein supplementation might not be that good of an idea. So if you are someone who has kidney disease, then I wouldn't suggest eating, you know, a large amount of protein and large being somewhere between zero point or above 0.7 grams of protein per pound of uh, body weight. So if you have kidney issues, then I would suggest staying below 0.7, somewhere between 0.5 to 0.7 grams per pound of body weight is better until the kidneys improve. That's what I would personally do. If uh, you don't have kidney issues, then you, you can eat, you know, theoretically you could eat like two grams of protein per pound of body weight. But, uh, you know, I would say it's unnecessary. First of all, you don't see additional muscle growth benefits beyond 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight. So most people don't need any more than 150 grams of protein per day and anything else is just going to be wasted. And, you know, who knows if you just for decades eat two grams of protein per pound of body weight, then, you know, eventually you might 
reduce your kidney function. So you know you don't need to do that. Uh, older people who uh, you know are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, they will naturally or not, not yeah, like kind of naturally or with age, you see a decline in kidney function. So uh, the elderly people generally would benefit from a higher protein intake because it helps them to maintain muscle mass, helps them to maintain bone density and other things, prevent malnutrition, those kind of things. So, but their kidney function tends to decrease with age. So again, that can be something of an individual basis. If you're an older person, but your kidneys are working poorly, you can't eat the high protein diet, then in those cases you could you know, consider like supplementing some amino acids that help to stave off muscle loss and frailty while at the same time not over stressing uh, the kidneys if that makes sense so if you are someone who is at a risk of sarcopenia and they already have kidney malfunction or poor kidney function then uh, amino acid supplementation or hmb for example can also like just reduce the sarcopenia and uh, still maintain adequate uh, or prevent also the excess protein or high protein intake from worsening uh, the kidney function next question others are saying bananas are just sugar what are your thoughts uh, well bananas you know when you look at the nutrition profile of bananas then they're not completely sugar yes they have quite a lot of sugar they're mostly carbohydrates but they also have a little bit of fiber although not a lot and you know minimal amount of protein as well so technically they, it's not true that it's sugar and bananas are still you know predominantly glucose and uh, some fructose as well so even then it's not the same molecule as uh, the table sugar and plus all the other things inside bananas as well and yes there are like different degrees of bananas green bananas are technically not sugar like they're actually very high in starch this resistant starch that can actually lower your blood sugar response it can have some positive effects on your microbiome as well but if you yeah like have a super ripe banana that is already like this brown then that's mostly like glucose uh, so it, there's a wide range of bananas out there and depends which one you eat i personally think you know yeah the green banana is probably healthier because it's more starchy and this uh, lower glycemic whereas the ripe banana yes it does you know have more glucose than fiber but uh, at least based on the the kind of studies out there people eating bananas aren't at a higher risk of diabetes or other you know blood sugar related conditions like insulin resistance or something like that so if bananas were to be bad because they're full of sugar then you would see in the evidence that people eating bananas would be you know increasing the risk of diabetes or they would have a higher rate of diabetes but you don't see that so you know you have to go you know think about it from a logical sense a little bit if this food is on paper bad but in the real world it doesn't pan out that way then it doesn't really matter <laughs> i think you know one banana isn't going to give you diabetes it's not going to be that significant you know the amount of carbs in one banana is also very small you get like 75 to 100 calories per banana out of which maybe five grams of glucose six seven grams depending on the ripening or is, is glucose so it's a, such a minuscule amount that most people don't see any significant effect or difference on their metabolic health or insulin sensitivity or anything like that and even more so the actual outcome data in humans doesn't suggest anything the like that eating fruit or bananas any any fruit in general that it would be associated with increased diabetes or increased other health problems so yeah i think bananas are perfectly fine yes they are higher in sugar than you know carrots or potatoes or or avocado some other fruits but it, uh, yeah, I mean, it's fine to have some fruits. It's fine to have some sugar in your diet. It's uh, from natural sources. It's that it, the the outcome data doesn't suggest that any fruit is uh, harmful in moderate amounts. Next question: What's my thoughts on BPC one fifty seven or peptides in general? So these peptides, short chained amino acids, uh, they are quite popular right now they're becoming more popular the fda is again trying to <laughs> ban them or restrict their access in the us uh, i think peptides they will probably in the next you know decade or so become like the standard at least for people who are interested in longevity and improving their health span that they will become standardized or more accessible 
everywhere that all the like healthcare and longevity clinics will start to use them and uh, the safety of course they're not FDA approved uh, that's why the FDA is probably trying to uh, restrict their access right now and get them uh, patented and those kind of things but you can't patent the uh, the peptides themselves so that, that's, that's why we're in this kind of conundrum right now with the FDA, FDA trying to restrict uh, their access have I used peptides myself I have used at least BPC 157 um, the there is also like instead of the injectable BPC 157 it's also the oral BPC 157 is available uh, one of the at least one brand has it other peptides like growth hormone peptides there's also peptides for uh, you know this increasing tanning melanotan <laughs> uh, I haven't used those kind of things but you know maybe in some cases growth hormone peptides can be useful but that again when you think about some of the physiology or biology of aging then growth hormone doesn't have like lifespan benefits it, it actually has the opposite so you don't i don't think it's a good idea to try to increase your growth hormone you know beyond super physiological levels <laughs> with uh, growth hormone peptides now you probably won't be able to do it with uh, the growth hormone peptides but if you if your body doesn't have low growth hormone production then you probably don't need to uh, inject growth hormone peptides as well and it might be actually in my opinion based on some of the animal models then excess growth hormone is certainly not beneficial for longevity maybe in the elderly who are producing a lot less growth hormone you're just filling the gap similar with trt or hormone replacement therapy you're just bringing you back to into like a normal physiological range rather than being in a deficient range so in those ca cases it probably is beneficial it it took it definitely improves quality of life you will just have more energy better body composition maybe slightly and easier fat loss but uh, yeah like larger amounts of or larger doses of growth hormone peptides for younger individuals probably isn't pro longevity it's actually probably bad for the longevity from the maximum lifespan perspective of course yeah there's a other many other peptides out there um but uh, yeah, it all depends on the situation, if it's worthwhile. BBC Mark 57, I think, is certainly very safe and um, it can improve like joint healing, gut healing, some other injuries. And, you know, professional athletes already use them quite regularly. And, uh, you know, again, if you don't have an injury, then you probably don't need to take it either. Uh, whereas, you know, if you ha have some sort of a tendon issue or something like that, then some people do anecdotally report that uh, BBC 157 helped them to heal that uh, faster. And my wife did have like a knee injury a few years ago as well. Uh, we did a lot of other things like collagen, red light, uh, good, you know, other amino acids and those kind of things. But we did use the oral BBC 157 as well. And she doesn't have any knee issues anymore. Whereas two years ago, she got an MRI with the knee and stuff like that. The doctor said she might need a surgery for the knee but it healed so yeah like but bpc 157 was one of the things that we used of course we, we don't know if it was the thing that made a difference but uh you know online there's other people as well saying that bpc 157 does help with uh tendon and joint injuries so yeah i would what i would do is definitely not buy them from the internet and from like the black market or something like that because you never know what you're gonna get you can get some tainted and contaminated products so you should definitely get them from an actual longevity clinic that uh, has, you know, quality uh, material. And the last question, what's your take on L-carnosine supplement? So carnosine is an amino acid that, I guess the main reason people take carnosine is that it inhibits advanced glycation end products. So these AGEs that uh, form when, uh, during the Maillard reaction, when you overcook or overfry foods, so proteins, as well as carbohydrates, they can interact and create these you know, nasty products that uh, can cause like uh, degradation of your collagen. They are implicated in diabetes, neurodegeneration and aging in general. But um, is carnosine a good supplement for AGEs? So uh, theoretically, yes, but uh, carnosine apparently isn't that bioavailable as a supplement. So the other alternative for that is beta alanine that actually creates carnosine inside the body. So a beta alanine also has other health benefits, like it can help with cholesterol levels, it can help with exercise performance. 
um, but it uh, is a much more, let's say, bioavailable or effective way to create carnosine inside the body rather than taking carnosine as a supplement. And another supplement that actually inhibits AGEs is uh, glycine. So that's another one of those very beneficial effects of glycine that it can, um, you know, reduce, inhibit the formation of AGEs. So uh, you can take glycine with every food because, you know, I don't like necessarily cook or fry my food. I eat mostly of my food is boiled or slightly cooked, not at high temperatures, uh, but I still take glycine because it's going to lower the blood sugar. It's going to lower the uh, inflammation, like inflammatory response. It's going to also inhibit the AGE formation. So yeah, I just take glycine with pretty much every uh, meal. And if you are cooking in high temperatures, then rosemary, these herbs, thyme, parsley, they all have anti-AGE, anti-glycative effects. And uh, yeah, just cook your whatever food that you are cooking in high temperatures, put like rosemary on the pan and cook the food with uh, the rosemary. That's going to be another like um, great way to reduce the AGEs. But that's it for this Q&A. If you want to ask me a question, then make sure to follow me on Instagram at Seamlund. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seam. Stay optimized, stay empowered.